Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Daniel Simpson. Daniel teaches yoga philosophy at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies on teacher trainings and online. He earned his master's degree in traditions of yoga and meditation at SOAS, the University of London, the home of the pioneering Hatha Yoga Project. He is the author of The Truth of Yoga, a comprehensive guide to the history of practice, which will be published in January by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And uh, I had the great pleasure of reading uh, a manuscript of Daniel's upcoming book, and we're going to speak a little bit about um, some of the content of that book today. So hello, Daniel. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Jacob. Good to be with you. So to begin, I would love to hear a little bit about kind of what inspired you to write this book on uh, the truth of yoga. The truth of yoga, of course, it's no small feat, uh, tackling <laughs> the truth. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit like what led up to, you know, the inspiration to, to write this book. Well, I guess it was a long time in the making. Um, it's the book I was hoping to read myself, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I started asking questions about what it was that I was doing. And I found it very hard to find good information. Um, there were, you know, I, I started out as an Iyengar yoga practitioner, and there are various books by BKS Iyengar, particularly in the introduction to Light on Yoga, where he sort of purports to give a, a summary of the history of yoga. And, you know, there's lots of good information in there, but... Uh, as a sort of overview that puts everything into its right place, a map I could work with to see how it all fitted together. I, I just didn't really know where to start. It, it was actually quite dense. It was quite difficult to read. And at the same time, it didn't seem to have very much to do with what the rest of the book was about with all the pictures of the postures. So um, I was struggling to sort of relate philosophy to practice in the first instance. And then also just to understand the whole evolution of the process. Um, it quickly became clear to me when I picked up some of the original texts that were first mentioned, you know, Yoga Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, and then eventually Hatha Pradipika, um, that you know, even there, the last one, which is teaching, you know, a variety of postures, that, that most of the things I was doing in my weekly classes weren't, weren't in the books. <laughs> so it seemed obviously yoga had been something else at some point, um, and it had then become what I knew, you know, more recently, it seemed, and uh, that kind of, you know, disillusioned me to a certain extent. I had this, this sort of fond image of yogis in caves doing trikonasana on Himalayan heights. <laughs> and, uh, um, I didn't really know what to make of this discovery. So I, you know, I wanted to find out more and that there, there really wasn't much to hold on to. I wasn't very immersed in the scholarly world then. Um, I had been working as a reporter. Um, I was uh, you know, transitioning into, into more of a focus on yoga. I actually wound up spending quite a few years in India. Um, and it was at that time that I picked up Mark Singleton's Yoga Body just after it had been published. And that really, you know, gave me something to hold on to, I guess. <laughs> it gave some sense uh, of um, explanation to this, this, this whole thing, that, that actually you know, a lot of things had evolved a lot more recently than I might have imagined. Um, although, obviously, there's, you know, there's, there's some ways in which that book, uh, for, for, for its own reasons, given that it evolved out of a PhD, which was quite narrowly focused, perhaps overemphasizes a, a particular moment in yoga history, uh, unless you read it very carefully. Um, but, you know, it's very clear that a lot of things had changed uh, relatively recently. Um, but I wanted to know what went on before that, because that didn't quite seem the whole story. And I didn't really know where to turn. And I started hearing about there being uh, university programs focused on yoga. I talked to Chris Chappell at uh, Loyola Marymount University, and uh, I was kind of keen on the idea of uh, moving to L.A., but um, I didn't have the funds. So, <laughs> uh and that so as uh, in London, they were starting up, uh, you know, the, the second major master's program looking at yoga. And uh, it was just at the time that Jim Mallinson had been hired as a, a Sanskrit lecturer. Uh, it just seemed like you know, this perfect moment. I could go and spend time with you know, one of the world experts on the history of yoga and I'd finally get some clear answers to these questions that I'd really struggled to, to, to sort of pin down for myself. So I guess, yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to sum up everything I've learned since then. <laughs> yeah. And it's really, I, you know, uh, as you said, I think I experienced a similar um, thing when I did my first yoga teacher training. Like there wasn't, there really wasn't a, a text that offered a comprehensive overview of, of the history of the tradition. And, and, and as you're highlighting, I mean, it really, over the last 10 years, it's kind of remarkable that it's really only in the last 10 years that there's started to be this sort of outpouring of, of more research and, and, um, and writings on the history of yoga that are, that are, um, somewhat different than the kind of 
traditionalist narratives that that a lot of people um, uh, uh, ascribe to, like the idea that the asanas are 5,000 years old and all of these other kinds of misunderstandings. And when I was reading your book, it really, it just, it, it strikes me as a perfect book for a teacher training's kind of, you know, curriculum and, and to read it as a part of a, of a required reading list. In fact, I hope to add it to our yoga philosophy training required reading list as well. Fantastic. I'm delighted to hear it. I mean, that's, that's one of the aims of writing it. I mean, I teach on teacher training programs and again, you know, I'm always being asked, what's the book to read? And I, and I keep saying, well, there's all these books that you should probably read, but it might be quite hard to get into them. So in a way, I've written this as a primer that's hopefully, you know, a stepping stone between not really knowing where to start and then reaching for the more scholarly work if you want to go deeper in any particular direction. Yeah, and I, it definitely succeeds in doing that from my perspective. And um, but I'm I'm curious, you know, there in in this kind of um, uh, you know context and where and where there are lots of new books on yoga's history emerging roots of yoga was written a couple of years ago what is the difference between what you're intending to do with this book and some of these other kind of histories that are coming out right now from from scholars i mean i think in some ways uh, the, the the sort of intention behind what i'm doing and, and the intention behind you know, the original project of roots of yoga is, is very similar it's to to present an overview of yoga's evolution through source texts. Um, I think where it differs, though, is that uh, you know I've stuck to, to by and large, the, the text that, that, that people first turn to and, and you know, tried to dispel some of the, the misinformation that circulates around them. I mean, the Yoga Sutra in particular is, is completely rewritten to suit people's preferences in the 21st century when it's taught in a teacher training context. Um, so I've tried as, as best I can to reflect what it actually says, while also saying that doesn't mean we have to implement all that to the letter. It just, just means that's what it says. And then it's up to us what we do with that. Um, whereas Roots of Yoga, of course, there are some quotes from um, you know, that text and, and many other texts that are familiar. But there's, there's 100 plus source texts in there and they, they've really gone for this you know, widespread and they've also packed so much information about you know, the last 20 years of yoga scholarship into these very, you know, sort of almost Wikipedia-like dense uh, summary articles at the start of each chapter. And that's an amazing resource. I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to write my book in some ways without being able to turn to that as a reference guide. But it's it's really a book that one would read as a reference guide um, or, uh, you know, scholars might reach for just, you know, for, 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 for looking where to dig a bit deeper into a particular subject. Um, but for the average yoga teacher, it's a very difficult read. And... Uh, in the end, it's going a lot deeper than most people are looking to go on that first you know, foray into the territory. So I'm hoping that a book like mine makes it easier for somebody to, to, to say, right now, I'm ready to go deeper into Roots of Yoga. Um, so that's where it differs, I suppose. It's, it, it's not a scholarly book, but then Roots of Yoga originally started as a Kickstarter program. So I don't think it was originally marketed as, as, as being quite what it became. But I mean, obviously, it became what it became because there's so much, you know, rich, fertile uh, you know, material available these days. And, and it's great to have that condensed into one volume. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a must have book if you, if you want to read more about where yoga has come from and, and how it's changed. But uh, at the same time, as I say, it's, it's not, it's not bedtime reading necessarily. Whereas I hope a book like mine, you could, you know, it's little bite-sized chunks, 500 words at a time. You could, you could read a bit, you know, for 10 minutes and then put it down and come back to it, you know, a few days later. It's, it's, it's very easy to come in and out of in that way. Yeah, and it's really it's broken up into nice little chunks. It's really it's it, you definitely um, uh, construct it in a way that makes it accessible as for for those that perhaps uh, their attention span um, don't go on for you know continuous ten thousand word articles or uh, other things that you find in the scholarly world. So one of the things that um, that I appreciate about your book is the the way it's written as we're describing it's written for practitioners or for yoga teachers to get a um to enter into the research um but there's also a sense that, that i get reading it as a practitioner that i can sort of i can see myself in the text or i recognize the sort of thread of practice that that mm -hmm. connects you know the contemporary history to to the the previous eras of history um, but then there are, you know, I think one of the things that I've heard from other practitioners with with some of the scholarly work is when they 
when they read a, a text like Roots of Yoga, which of course is an incredibly um, rich and useful text for, for scholars or for who, people who really want to geek out on the history. But sometimes there is a sense in which um, the practitioner doesn't recognize themselves in the text. It's such that they think, well, well, I'm doing this and this is what yoga was. So I must be doing something that isn't authentic and therefore I should just, you know, reject this practice and, you know, move on and do something else. So there, there is this sense that you and I have spoken of before where, where the practitioner's relationship with the scholarship can actually disempower their relationship with the practice. So I'm wondering what you think um, about that <laughs> um, and, you know, and what kind of the practitioner's relationship should be with, with all of this new and emerging scholarship. Well, I think the first thing to emphasize is obviously engagement with it all is optional. There's, there's you know, there's, there's no obligation to, to immerse yourself in this stuff. And as you say, geek out on the history. Um, if, 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 you know, if you feel called to do that, wonderful. But um, at the same time, it's perfectly okay to enjoy whatever you do. And um, there's, there's, there's no need to feel it's called into question by the fact that people have you know, got a lot better handle on, on how things have changed over time. But if, if you know, that sparks some curiosity in you, then it's great to be able to dive in and not have it, you know, completely undermine everything that you do. And, and I've been through that process. I mean, the master's program for me was, was pretty much that. I'd, I'd been through a phase of getting more and more disillusioned with the approach to asana practice that I'd sort of grown up in in the yoga world to the point that I, I just sort of jettisoned it. And uh, after that, I'd become a sort of yoga nomad. I didn't didn't really have a, a fixed uh, home um, or, or a particular lineage or teacher that I, you know, I was, I was aligned with. I, I'd begun my own process of inquiry and exploration, I suppose, which was very healthy, but that coincided with going deeper into this scholarly study and uh, increasingly thinking that, you know, none of the stories I'd ever heard from anybody were, were, were reliable. And in fact, that uh, yoga itself was some sort of fraud being perpetrated on, on, on the masses of the late 20th and early 21st century. Uh, convincing us um, in some ways, you know, to, to, to sort of um, hoodwink ourselves about the potential for, for self-transcendence and transformation when actually we were just becoming, you know, you know more, more compliant cogs in the capitalist machine, as some people might have it. And you know, there's all that angle on things. And then there's the whole, as you say, sense that, well, what I'm doing doesn't bear a great deal of relation to what's been described in most of the old texts. So therefore it's inauthentic or or wrong, or in, in some way unproven, um, or made up. I mean, everything's made up. It's uh, unless you really take literally that uh, Shiva spoke the tantras, um, or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think the thing I've tried to do is to first of all write from the perspective of, of, of somebody who, who, who didn't know very much when I started. You know, I knew about other things. I knew a lot about Balkan politics. <laughs> The corruption of the the, the, the corporate media. Um, I could go off on a long digression about those things, but I didn't know very much about the history of yoga or yoga philosophy. So I, I you know, I, I want to speak to somebody who's in the same position. I don't want to patronise them and make them feel like they're ignorant. I'm not suggesting that's what scholars intend to do, but that can sometimes be the effect of you know the the level of discourse that they're operating at because they're talking primarily to each other. I mean, that's that's what one does as a scholar. Um, obviously, there are public facing events where one tries to do something different, but um, still necessarily, I think the, the content and the tone sort of floats a little bit above the, the level of you know, get, getting down and engaging with practitioners. Although some scholars also then give workshops in yoga studios and they switch into almost a different mode. And it's very, you know, it's uh, very heartening to see that happening. But at the same time, you know, I, I realized that when that isn't happening, the alienation effect very easily kicks in as a sense of I've got it all wrong. These people know a lot more than me. They're basically telling me that, you know, everything that I try to pin down about yoga is contradicted by something else somewhere else. Therefore, it's impossible to say what yoga is, um, apart from to suggest that what you're doing isn't it. <laughs> and so if you're left with that feeling, that's not very inspiring, obviously, and whether that's the intention of a lot of people in the scholarly community or not. And I don't think it is. I should emphasize um, it can have that effect just because of the nature of the discourse. I mean, the whole level of uh, engagement with material sort of at graduate level and beyond is, is supposed to be critical. That's what defines the Western academic approach. Uh, if you haven't got critical engagement going on with your sources, then you're not going to get your PhD. So. Uh, in a way, pulling things to pieces is, is the order of the day to a certain extent, rather than constructing, you know, beautiful castles in the sky that people might wish to inhabit. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
So, you know, we're talking kind of interchangeably about um, yoga's history and philosophy. And uh, certainly in your book, from from my perspective, it's a it's a, a mixture of both. Um, but, you know, what from your perspective, what is the difference between hi- history and philosophy um, uh, when it comes to yoga? Well, it's, I mean, I'm often engaged uh, on a teacher training program to teach yoga philosophy. And, and, and I realize actually what I'm expected to teach is yoga history. Um, it's to explain how things you know, are slightly different in different contexts at different times. Um, and therefore to present the texts in that way. Um, you know, there's a little bit of this from the Yoga Sutra, a little bit of that from the Bhagavad Gita, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but actually, you know, I think, I think yoga history is, is, is a very important thing to understand because it shows that process of evolution and it shows that uh, there really isn't this sort of uh, you know, pure, pristine, primordial yoga from which everything has become corrupted. There's just been lots of rearranging in different contexts. So seeing things from that perspective is helpful. But yet at each stage of the process, the philosophy exists. Um, each, each sort of context has a worldview that's uh, put together as a, a means for transcending this uh, you know, suffering-inducing existence whereby we're lost in our minds, caught up in you know, all of the ways in which we can compound the misery of being human. <laughs> or on the other hand, we can reverse the process and perhaps unwind that. Um, and uh, yeah, there are philosophies around that. There are different approaches to, 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 to that basic project, which seems to underpin most of the yoga tradition. And uh, therefore, you know, one needs to sort of understand how they work as systems of ideas, although ultimately the, the state that they're always pointing towards is beyond the conceptual realm. So you, know, you build this, this whole structure, it's like scaffolding to erect a building, and then the scaffolding falls down and then there's no building. So it's a, it's a very strange process, but at the same time, one does have to have that structure in place. Otherwise, one builds some sort of wonky castle that doesn't stand up and falls over. Um, and I think you know, that's, that's what's very interesting about these traditions. They have... Uh, you know, very complex and layered uh, philosophies that, that, again, aren't very well represented in, in, in a Western context because they've been reduced to a sort of very surface level engagement with them. Uh, I mean, the classic example for me is, is people thinking that Patanjali's yoga is all about eight limbs rather than, you know, it's, it's a very practical method, but it's not really got eight parts. <laughs> it's got really one part uh, and then the part that's beyond that. You know, focus on an object so you don't need an object to focus on and that's Patanjali's yoga. But then there's a whole system of philosophy that explains how that works and why you would engage in it and what you have to do in order to you know, not be drawn away from that object by all these other objects that are distracting you. Um, and so I think you know, it's, it, it's, it's impossible to engage with if you don't understand the philosophical context as well. But that philosophical context has got nothing to do with eight parts. <laughs> Uh, the eight part bit seems to be the link with lots of other philosophies. You know, the Buddhist system has eight parts. There are other eight part systems dotted through texts. There's medical texts that have eight parts. It seems to be a sort of metaphor for systems that help. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's sort of one way in which philosophy can get misrepresented in, in a not very empowering way. Um, it's very empowering to realize that the basic message of Patanjali's first sutra, the commentary that goes with it, says samadhi is there, <laughs> it's in the background. What we have to do is learn to get out of the way and then problem solved uh, rather than some sort of contorted process of trying to still the mind, which you know, basically can set you at war with yourself. And it's not the aim of the system at all. Um, and that, that's all to do with this you know, philosophical basis on which it's constructed, as well as you know, the practical orientation of meditation. Um, but again, it's being taught in a modern postural yoga context where people are trying to sort of understand that, you know, making shapes is somehow the third rung on the ladder and it will eventually lead to the top of the stairway to heaven and everything's great. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't really work that way. So you have to see the philosophy for what it is in order to make sense of the practice that's being outlined in the text. And again, I've, you know, I've tried to simplify that to the extent that it's accessible without doing away with the complexity that's kind of necessarily part of it. Mm, mm. So I love that we're kind of pointing out, or you're pointing out um, some kind of common misunderstandings. You're talking about the eight limbs being an example. Um, Can you share maybe, you know, another couple uh, examples of, you know, in the current yoga environment, things that are like radically misunderstood and, and how in your book you outline the alternative? (laughs) 
Well, I don't wish to give the impression that it's a, you know, it's a wholesale debunking job. It's not that I've got the truth and everyone's got it wrong. I mean, it's very much not that way. It's, it's, it's uh, as I say, and as you've already drawn attention to, I mean, the, you know, the first truth really here is that, that there isn't a single truth. There are many different systems approaching things in different ways. Um, but uh, what tends to happen is they all get jumbled together. Um, so you know, modern yoga isn't just exclusive to the West by any means. I mean, that's what I encountered when I tried to make sense of what BKS Iyengar is doing in a lot of his books, for example. Um, the Indian you know, sort of modern tradition of teaching is, is to, to, to sort of pull it all from, from this sort of you know, timeless yoga tradition and suggest it's all, it's all somehow congruent. Um, and the first thing that strikes me as an example of how it isn't is the idea that yoga means union. Um, I mean, technically, it comes from a Sanskrit root that does have uh, an implication of joining things together as one of its meanings. Another of its meanings, though, is a, a process of concentration, which is what Patanjali's talking about. Patanjali's system isn't talking about union at all. In fact, it very explicitly says in the second chapter that union is the problem that yoga exists to resolve. Um, so the, the solution is disconnection, <laughs> disjunction, v-yoga, uh, to, to solve the problem of some yoga. Um, and because we're all entangled in the world, we're lost. If we can disentangle ourselves and separate radically from all material things, including the body and the mind, there's some hope. And that isn't about union in any way, shape or form. However, over the years, many of the commentators on the Yoga Sutra were scholars of Vedanta and uh, particularly Advaita Vedanta talking about, you know, the oneness. So somehow this uh, this distinction has been collapsed over time to the point where it doesn't seem to really exist in modern yoga circles um, to the point that even people talk about, you know, yoga is the union of Purusha and Prakriti, which is the exact opposite of what potentially is trying to explain. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's one example, but um, I mean, yeah, it's just an idea. It doesn't really affect what people do necessarily. Um, on a practical level, I think one thing that's, that's very striking, and again, I'm far from the first to observe this, is, is uh, you know, the way in which people relate to the idea of chakras and the whole idea of this uh, yogic body. Um, chakras seem to have become a metaphor for the existence of their big, you know, so, so, so some subtler approach to embodiment that can't necessarily be found by dissect, dissecting corpses. And invested with all these inherent properties that we're supposed to somehow, you know, access it, it, through through a yoga practice, align, uh, and through that alignment somehow, you know, harmonize, purify, cleanse, whatever the whatever the word might be. They were focal points for meditation in their original presentation, and um, you know, they're very rich in the way that they're presented, and they're very different as well. <laughs> there aren't just the sort of the six with the one above the head that we're familiar with in you know, most modern yoga contexts. And they certainly don't have rainbow-like colors or associations with endocrine glands or suits of the tarot or whatever it might be. And, and, and instead, they're, they're places in which you know, particular energies are installed through a conscious, uh, internalized visualization process. Um, and that's the origin. But they've become something else now. They've morphed with new age thinking and all sorts of Western psychological priorities uh, in very recent times, much more recently than a lot of asanas have been invented. And uh, people are now, you know, giving countless workshops on what chakras will do for you. And, and obviously, you know, if you if you enter them with a certain mindset, thinking that way, you might well experience that in your body. I mean, the mind and the body are connected very powerfully. I mean, that's what chakras were originally for, visualization projects. So if you go in there expecting to light them all up and, you know, unblock your throat chakra, fantastic, you probably will. <laughs> yeah, but that, that may then be a placebo effect. And I think one of the sort of great unexplored areas about yoga, when people like to talk about it scientifically, is the extent to which we're conducting this sort of experiment on ourselves that is a little bit, you know, sort of um, not really sort of, uh, uh, it's magical in a way, but it's it's transformative according to a certain script. And that, that was the way it was presented in origin, you know, originally in the tantras that had a huge influence on physical practice. And you're, you're, you're almost sort of tattooing your body with these deity energies to the point that they sort of permeate it and make it something else. Um, so we're imagining things into being, and they're not imaginary once they've come into being. Um, but we're, you know, we're not necessarily observing what is in, in that way. And if we go back to the various sort of earliest descriptions of, of what meditation was about, and the Buddhist tradition in particular, talking just about that, you know, things as they are. Um, I think yoga, when it gets into the realm of transforming the body and, and transforming our embodiment. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, 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 it's shifted away just from observing things as they are and, and imagining how they could be and making them real. And 
it's only a short step from there to the secret and manifesting and all sorts of other new age things. So it's very easy to see how everything gets jumbled together and it's suggested that that's what Patanjali teaches. But uh, I think, I guess what I'm really trying to emphasize is that it's interesting to see how things come from different places. It's interesting to see how they get combined. Um, that's not to say that people who combine them are wrong or, or, or misleading everybody necessarily, or, although I think it is helpful to go back to the original sources, see how they're you know, presenting the same information. Um, but it's to acknowledge that, that, that that's, that's what the tradition itself has been doing you know, in all of its process of evolution, is just to take things from different places, combine them together, act as if it was always that way and that there's no distinction. Um, and if we're wanting to make more sense of those systems, though, it's useful to see, you know, what's this bit, what's that bit? And then perhaps if I want to go deeper down into you know, that particular silo, then I know what comes from that philosophy rather than a different one. Otherwise, in the end, we're just sort of you know, making these, these, these strange drawings <laughs> in our minds that maybe have some connection to the way things have been done, maybe don't. But again, I don't wish to invalidate that. If people find that useful, that's, that, that's totally fine. <laughs> but if they're interested in, in, in you know, what connection that has to the way things have been done in the past, then perhaps seeing you know parallels and also distinctions is important rather than just assuming it's it's all one bundle. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you're pointing this out about how you know traditions um, can emerge anew at at the intersection of of different traditions. And I think with the the I'm glad you talked about the chakras because the chakras are I think an example where a kind of a whole sort of new age, you know, kind of east west um, kind of um, uh, integration of, of, of things happened. And now there's this whole, you know, narrative around blocking and balancing and all of that stuff. And, and for some people, it's been effective. Um, but, but then there's also this issue of then people misunderstanding that as sort of the original utility the original meaning of the chakras when as you were you went as you were saying um they really were visualization devices meditation devices and so i'm wondering you know what the when it becomes a problem like should the new chakra narratives call themselves something else or um you know how do we at the at once kind of support the original history and utility of the chakras and maybe even as a result of that continue practicing them in in this visualization kind of way um well i, th I think i mean if i could jump in with it with an answer to what it sounded like it was building up to it's just sort of um yeah but where do we draw the line between what 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 completely misrepresents things and, and, and really ought to be discouraged and 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 what's a valid process of you know creative interpretation? And I guess what I want to say in response to that is I'm not the yoga police. I'm 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 also you know not going to engage in the fool's errand of trying to stamp out things that people are you know very happy doing. Um, uh, it's certainly not going to work, and um, it's not going to endear me to them or or, or or be any satisfying process for for, for me. And yet at the same time. I do think it's important to point out the distinctions um, and at the same time to just yeah, focus on what's useful for us as well. So maintaining a particular orientation towards practice, uh, perhaps in connection to ancient texts, if we feel called to. I mean, there's absolutely no obligation to do that either. It's, uh, there's some crazy stuff taught in old texts. I was looking at Roots of Yoga the other day and re refreshing my memory of the, the great external doughty where you prolapse your rectum, wash it in a river for 90 minutes and then whack it back up. Um, <laughs> so, not not what I'm going to do before my morning morning asana, um, but still, um, you know, there, there, there is validity to, to to trying to understand what what, what 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 has a connection to tradition. There's also validity to teaching that and preserving it. And again, another priority I suppose I've had in in, in the book is to try and show what is traditional in these different contexts uh, without trying to say that thou shalt then do it this way more just if you want to find connection points to tradition here are some here are the references to go and read it for yourself pick your own translation it's fine but go to the texts and use that as the springboard um but we can't stop other people doing another thing <laughs> it's that they're, they're just going to do it anyway um, I don't really want to live in the kind of world where 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 where, where one is outlawed, banned, <laughs> jailed for, <laughs> from the world of yoga, and no longer allowed to practice. Um, if if you're doing it a different way, I just don't really necessarily want to do that myself, um, or be engaged in promoting it. <laughs> and so instead, I've tried to write a book that promotes 
what I found useful, which is going back to the original text and, and as I say, weighing things up, seeing that some things, some things need reinterpreting. I mean, for a start, I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking to escape from, from rebirth as my number one priority in my yoga practice. I came to yoga as somebody who was, I guess, you know, I was anxious and depressed. I, I'd burned myself out as a, as a correspondent living in weird parts of the world. Um, and I just needed something that would ground me and, and, and make me feel a bit more content to be in my body. And, and, and I found it through asana practice. And that's, there's no harm in that. I think that's definitely fine. And also, you know, using creative new age ways of, of exploring how to enjoy being embodied and connected to each other. That, that's totally fine. But the original point I think you were building up towards was, should we change the name if it goes too far away from the original source? And, you know, I think there is a case for that. But again, I can't go around telling other people to do it. I'm not going to hold up placards outside their yoga studios going inside of people who are debasing yoga, culturally appropriating it. Uh, I just don't think that discourse takes anybody anywhere. It's, it's a way of empowering authoritarians, to be honest. I don't think it does much for liberation. Yeah. Um, so I want to come back to that topic in a bit. But before we do that, I, I've been meaning to circle back to, you know, the eras of yoga's history that you discuss in mm. the book. And I'd like to just walk through each period and just kind of get a brief overview of of what the sure. defining features are of these particular eras and, 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 you know, why this classification or as a result of seeing the defining features, then we can maybe further understand the classification. And the classification is you in your book, early yoga, classical yoga, hatha yoga and modern yoga. So can you talk a little bit about each of these periods? Hmm. Well, I guess, I mean. I've approached it backwards in a way. I mean, modern yoga is what I grew up in. It's what's around us. And um, when I went to study it, so as I think what I was looking for was was a program that would start with modern yoga and work backwards from there and explain how things you know evolved to this point. Instead, what I got was uh, <laughs> you know a, a, an acknowledged expert on Vedic history constantly wagging his finger at a room full of fluffy headed yoga teachers trying to say there's no yoga in the Vedas. And, and you know. He, so to, a, to a certain extent, he's right. But um, at the same time, there are still, you know, the, the earliest seeds uh, on which texts such as the Upanishads will, 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 will build a whole philosophy that is now, you know, the way in which yoga is said to mean union. Uh, they're found in those early texts. Um, and there are ideas that influence ascetics that, that come from the Vedic sacrificial tradition, even if this, this, this other tradition of uh, renunci renunciate movements uh, was beyond that world. So I think, I think, you know, the Vedas really are the earliest source document that we have access to. Um, so that's, that's really the sort of anchor point for that chapter and Vedas and Upanishads, which is sort of the last part of the Vedas to say that's, that's where a lot of ideas that influence yoga uh, come from. Um, there is of course, the question of what came before that to which we have really no possible possibility of finding an answer. Um, I mean, there are fragments of evidence uh, that, 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 that people have made a lot out of considering how small those fragments are like the, the seals from the Indus Valley civilization. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge that you know, making any sense of those requires us to read things into into our interpretation from much later in history that just aren't found in the evidence from that time. So I don't think we can say with any confidence that yoga is much older than you know, two and a half thousand years based on what's in texts. I would say, of course, that it's entirely possible that it's many, many years older than that. But we can't find any proof because there aren't sources that say definitively, here's a thing called yoga. Uh, this is what it consists of. Um, and uh, this is how you go about uh, engaging with it. Uh, whereas we do find that in the Upanishads, uh, particularly the Kato Upanishad, probably the earliest sort of definition of yoga. You also find descriptions of people engaged in these ascetic practices uh, from outsiders, such as Alexander the Great's uh, invading army. Um, also from the Buddha, who talks about you know, dabbling in some of the more extreme practices of yoga before choosing his middle way. Um, so there's all that sort of evidence in the early period of the roots of yoga, really, but it's very, very hard to say you know, how far back in time they go. But it is quite clear that once once we've got definitions of yoga as a thing, systems start to construct themselves on that. So the next phase, looking at what I've called classical yoga, is really the text that people turn to most often, the, the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutra, and trying to understand where they come from, because neither of those is really an original piece of work. They're they're, they're compilations in a way, they're summaries of a, a lot of the stuff that's gone before, a lot of what I've just been talking about, but also, you know, from other places like Buddhism, Jainism, some of the other renouncer traditions that, that really came up with the idea of yoga, because um, it was, uh, you know, a solution to a problem 
that the Vedic sacrificial tradition wasn't really engaging with this concern about rebirth and the problem of uh, you know, misunderstanding who we are that perpetuates that process. I mean, I really had to sum up in you know, one sentence, what is the truth of yoga? We're not what we think. It's as simple as that. And all these different traditions in different ways are trying to show us that. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's what goes on in the classical period is the systematization. But there's another, you know, the, the text in which the Bhagavad Gita is embedded, the Mahabharata, it's full of uh, passages on, on uh, you know, yoga as, as a practice, yoga as a system of philosophy, yoga in relation to Sankhya philosophy, um, and a lot of the ideas from the Upanishads sort of repackaged as well. So it's it's really the first yoga manual in some ways, um, although potentially gets a lot more credit <laughs> for being you know, the, the synthesizer of the yoga system. But then after that phase, you know, there's a whole new wave of invention that, 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 that comes along, um, very much influenced by this 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 tantric idea of uh, transformation, um, transforming the body into, uh, you know, literally the, the embodiment of divinity um, through various ritual processes. And uh, that has an enormous impact on what was previously quite an ascetic way of engaging with the problem. Uh, problem is, you know, the world causes us to get tangled up in it through the senses in such a way that we misidentify who we are and suffer. Uh, solution, renounce the world, <laughs> get, get away from that problem. Restraint, turn inwards, let go. And um, Tantra introduces this possibility of, well, maybe we just sort of recalibrate our engagement with it. And, and the Bhagavad Gita had some of those ideas in there, but it wasn't talking about the body in the same way, whereas Tantra talks about the body and then physical Hatha Yoga comes out of that. So this third phase is really about, you know, how the combination of tantric philosophy and ascetic practice produced postural yoga as we know it. So that's, that's really the time, maybe a thousand years ago, there was this creative fusion that, that really changed something quite quite radical in in the way in which the body was regarded. Um, and from there, we can chart, you know, the last thousand years of, of evolution towards what we have today. And the final section is really looking at what's happened in the last, you know, 100, 150 years when you have that more people refer to as medieval or early modern afterwards uh, phase of, of physical yoga practice and it's still very different to what we have today um, there aren't postures taught in sequences to groups of people standing on mats um, none of that that we can see anyway uh, in the sources uh, whereas there's a huge you know as i was going back to talking about earlier um yoga body by mark singleton charting this this phase of great creativity um and he was obviously also you know, influenced by those who'd done a lot of work before him there's, there's been scholarship done on this for the last 25 years but um it's really become refined and in, you know, just in the last 10 15 years the time since uh you know, mark started work on his his phd and, and uh then you know published his book and and uh, lots of others were, were were inspired by it into this 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 great uh sort of interaction between east and west um, and uh, cross-pollination process that goes backwards and forwards so often that it's almost impossible to unravel <laughs> partly due to colonial occupation obviously so this is where you know the whole question of how, how the west has, has, has mistreated this yoga tradition acquires some currency really i mean we do have to acknowledge that uh, the globalization of yoga is partly a, a, a factor of, of british imperialism and uh, the, the, the 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 sort of cross-cultural exchange that took place in that context um, and so that influenced in a way some of the, the processes that made yoga more physical more about you know developing the body bodybuilding almost in some ways and that gave us vinyasa flow <laughs> and other such things that are much more familiar so the, the last chapter looks at all those things in you know hopefully in accessible ways and then right up to the present the yeah, the cultural appropriation of yoga by you know, Hindu nationalist politicians. Um, they've decided to, 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 to see in yoga and its global popularity a great opportunity for a bit of soft power projection and uh, you know, a bit of reinvention of, of, of historical facts, to be honest, um, you know, to, to try and present a story that aligns with a worldview that, uh, that makes India a you know, land of the Hindus and uh, a not very welcoming place quite often for, for minorities. Mm. So I want to ask a, a follow-up question to, you know, you mentioning yoga, yoga body, which of course is, is, is um, as we know, has made a huge splash um, a number of years ago now and kind of threw a wrench in traditional narratives about yoga. Um, and it was kind of so controversial that some, like, for example, Eddie Stern have want Mark to apologize <laughs> to the yoga community for confusing us. 
Um, so, you know, what is your view? You know, was the thesis of yoga body just misunderstood? Was it overstated or was it a bit of both? Uh, I should choose my words carefully. I mean, I, I like Mark a lot and I have a huge respect for his contribution to, to my personal understanding and, you know, collectively our, our, our communal understanding of the history of yoga. But um, I, th- I, think, I think he could have phrased some of the things in his book a little more clearly. It, so, 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 so some of the framing of the argument, particularly in the, the opening section, uh, makes it sound like he's trying to have it both ways. Um, on the one hand, he's trying to say there's absolutely no connection between traditional Hatha yoga and this thing that emerges in the 20th century and then sort of gets on his high horse later when people start criticizing him, saying, how could you possibly think that's what I was trying to say? I'm just talking about contexts in which things happen. Um, but there are some fairly you know, sort of definitive statements uh, to the effect of the, the, the first category that I talked about, um, that, that there isn't a connection. Um, and uh, there isn't a lot of uh, discussion, partly because this information wasn't as clear as it's become in the last 10 years, of just the breadth and, and extent of, of um, you know, what was there in, in traditional Hatha yoga texts uh, in, in, in terms of postural practice. And uh, I think a lot of that has come to light uh, more clearly through the work that he and Jim Mallinson came to do together as a result of him publishing that book, Jim Mallinson sort of criticized a little bit that representation of yoga history at the beginning that, that didn't didn't quite do justice to some of his research but that wasn't widely known in the way that it is now it also wasn't you know, easily accessible online i mean you or i can go to a website like academia.edu and download you know vast quantities of material that previously were locked away in journals that you'd have to join a university library to access or perhaps chapters in books that cost five hundred dollars you know things that we're ne- just never going to buy <laughs> but those things are now available. So as, as as a young researcher, you can read everything. You can also find in all sorts of dark web holes of the internet, you know, mo- most of the world's published material in PDFs. And academics, strangely enough, are the people that are exchanging that information amongst each other, right, left and center. You can log on to their, 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 their chat group at um, Indology.info. They're always asking each other for digital copies of things. And it's how you, it's how you, you know, make make it possible to work particularly in this 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 covid climate but uh, i mean they acknowledge i think that the information has been a bit buried too much and needs to be a bit more freely able to circulate so i think yeah um at the same time i, th- I think if you actually read the book line by line without getting your buttons pressed by some of the contentious statements yoga body does make a fairly clear case for what it's trying to say which is in this particular you know moment of history various forces intersected in such a way that uh, the representation of the body and the engagement with the body uh, was very different to to, to, to what had gone before for some very clear reasons related to politics, um, to to the history of the the, the, the occupation of India by the British Empire and the resistance to that, and then a reappraisal of what, what Hatha Yoga was. But I guess what makes me a bit sceptical, and it's what one does to write a PhD, is you have to say, you know, I've got this new thing, and this this thing happened at this moment that I've pinned down, and that's you know world transforming. Um, I mean, in in the end, it's sort of the idea that despite this rich history of Hatha Yoga that was apparently very popular, you know, right into the early modern era, and, and then suddenly because the British were rude about it, and not just the British, a lot of colonial occupying forces uh, as well as the British, um, because they found themselves confronted by you know warrior sadhus you know, trying try, trying to prevent them from 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 doing their 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 their, their, their looting. Um, they like to say, you know, all these Hindu holy men, they're a bit weird, you know, they're, 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 they're charlatans and beggars and whatnot. And, and so Yoga Body starts with this presentation that physical yoga is outlawed and Vivekananda's rude about it. And, and therefore, you know, suddenly within 20 years, it's rehabilitated. And that's this thing that he's going to focus on. But was it that outlawed? Was it that rehabilitated? Or it's, it's a period of a shift, absolutely and unquestionably. But uh, it can't also have been this rich source of all the material that the Hatha Yoga Project's been studying for for the you know the last five years. Uh, if at the same time that all that went underground, um, I think inevitably one focuses on areas of discourse, and there was a discourse in which it was marginalised and later became rehabilitated. Um, but maybe throughout that period, there were yogis in caves doing what they'd been doing. And uh, obviously, nobody was taking photos of them. So we've got no access to that. And I think I only mention it in that way, because I think that's always the, the thing one has to bear in mind, uh, reading things, including my book. I mean, I've tried to acknowledge it where I can, but you know, there's so much we don't know. Um, 
all we can do is deal with what's you know available to us now in the form of you know written or or uh, other form of, of uh, material evidence and um, anything else is guesswork uh, and we can you know conjecture all manner of things but we can't prove it so the scholars are obviously focused on material that's you know as cast iron as it can be but you know, which they can use as material to to, to make their arguments make their cases um, but that doesn't mean that that's that the, that's the whole story. Uh, but unfortunately, you don't get very far if you pepper all of your scholarly articles with caveats about, you know, we can't really be sure that there's a load of stuff that we don't know. Uh, pe pe people need to hear a very clear case of, I've found this thing out, it's definitive, and so on and so forth. I think, I think to a certain extent, Yoga Body was a little bit, you know, hamstrung by that tendency, because that's what one does to get a PhD. And uh I think you know, Mark got disillusioned a little bit by the you know the process of putting it out into the world, the reaction he faced, and, and people you know, felt misunderstood. I think, but you know, at the same time, it's difficult with 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 that sort of message to a yoga practitioner community that wasn't as well aware of these things as as many more people are these days. And uh, so, I think if he was rewriting the book now, whatever he might say in public, he would he would he would perhaps do it differently. <laughs> Or well, maybe not. He likes. He certainly likes to. He likes to say say things clearly, and, and he's he's not afraid of speaking his mind. So perhaps he would do exactly the same. I, I don't wish to put words in his mouth. Sorry. No. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll ask him next time we get an opportunity to interview him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in the years since Yoga Body, you know, I feel like the public um, discussion around yoga has gotten even more heated. Um, with, uh, you know, you're mentioning how you would not ever wish to be uh, the yoga police. However, there are quite a few people out there today who are very content to be, to position themselves as the yoga police, um, particularly around um, claims about the authenticity of yoga, the truth of yoga, um, and, uh, and, and questions around cultural appropriation. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. And um, I can already tell you have something sort of nuanced to add to that conversation because you use cultural misappropriation in the context of, of mentioning the, the Indian government, which of course most people wouldn't use that term because usually it's only reserved for white appropriators, right? Anybody who is outside India um, uh, is, is, um, is a candidate for the misappropriation of yoga that's destroying the world and is contributing to imperialism and colonialism. Um, but nothing like that ever happens, you know, by Indians. So can you talk a little bit about what your what what kind of the definition of cultural appropriation is that you're using um, that would suggest that something like a political uh, use of yoga would be a misappropriation? Well, I mean, it's a very loaded term. And uh, you know, my instinct is to turn it back to you and say, what do you think it means? Um, but uh... <laughs> I'll spare us that little 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 diversion and, and, and get get myself back on the spot. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that you know, this is about abuse, really. That's what people are talking about. Um, so it's not just about taking ideas from another place. Um, it, there's got to be some malice involved um, and uh, you know, complete lack of respect. Um, and obviously, you know, this is not just very much influenced by the history of colonial occupation. But so much of modern discourse around these subjects has become so binary um, and it's really become a way by which people can reinforce their ideas about themselves uh, as, as being righteous uh, and others as being the enemy um, and somehow complicit in, in, in all that is wrong with the world. Uh, so there's just these you know, endless finger wagging contests between different camps about different points. But if it really comes down to exploitation, I think, which is really the word that's, that's, that's sort of at the core of it all, I mean, you know, the British exploited India without doubt, looted its, its resources. Um, so if there's some sort of echo of that in the way that the, the, the yoga has been commoditized and, and globalized, um, I can see why that will annoy people. Um, so one has to be a little bit mindful of that, tread a little bit sensitively uh, and uh, not act like we're the sort of guardians of this stuff, like as if we're sort of, the uh, the trustees of the British Museum saying you can't have your you know, Parthenon marbles back. <laughs> it's uh, it, it, we, we, we've inherited something. It's come from somewhere else. We've got to, you know, we're guests in in that culture in a way. If we're if we're trying to immerse ourselves in the traditions of yoga, um, but at the same time, there's enormous disrespect and exploitation taking place in India with relation to yoga. I mean, the most striking example to me is is uh, perhaps you know, the other. 
the world's most famous yogi, although he's perhaps less famous in the West, um, Ramdev in India, uh, made himself a, a like Donald Trump star through reality TV, um, got a lot of political influence, um, and he's built this enormous business, uh, which was originally uh, sort of Ayurvedic goods, but it's now you know, anything that you can sell, really, you know, toothpaste, jeans, um, and he called it Patanjali. And if you stick Patanjali into Google Images, all you get is his products. You don't you know anything to do with the Yoga Sutra. So, I mean, if that isn't cultural appropriation, I don't know what is, to be honest. But again, you're never really going to hear that in the same way uh, as you'll hear where white people um, you know, being maligned for what they may or may not have done to, to, to the nobility of, of, of the tradition. And, and often that's coming from a quite, you know, sort of dogmatic interpretation of the world uh, yeah, from a Hindi perspective, whether the people who are making those points are Indian or Western. In fact, some of the shrillest uh, denouncers of white people for their, their their cultural appropriation sins are other white people um, who are trying to portray themselves as holier than now. It is always a always a messy messy world to get into, um, and I don't think it's very easy to draw the line. I think it's also yeah, at the same time important to acknowledge that some things clearly go beyond the line, but they're not exclusive to white Western yoga teachers. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate you mentioning and really kind of pointing to the exploitation as being kind of the essence of, of, of the issue when there is when there are issues around cultural misappropriation. I kind of wonder if cultural exploitation might be a better term um, just because, you know, it, it, it seems like it's hard to um, imagine a world in which some form of appropriation doesn't happen. I mean, people steal from each other all the time, consciously and unconsciously. And, and as we were saying, you know, new modes of thought, new traditions, new uh, schools of thinking often um, emerge at the intersection of, of, you know, two traditions that have sort of been brought together. And, 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 and I think, you know, that in some sense, to imagine that that would ever stop taking place is a bit naive, you know? And so what we can do is really, uh, you know, as you're suggesting, kind of um, attend to the manner in which those movements are exploiting individuals um, or exploiting different traditions or cultures and um, and and kind of tease that out from um, the inst instances where respectfully um, there's a kind of... Uh, integration of, of different schools of thought or traditions? I mean, let's be honest, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a white guy living in England. I'm a householder. I, I, I wasn't raised as a Hindu. I might, I might work for an institution with, with the word Hindu in, in the title, but I, you know, I don't even really consider myself a Hindu. I don't even know that one can become a Hindu. I mean, the term originally relates to inhabitants of a geographical area. Um, so at the same time, I think, you know, it's possible to be respectful and, um, I think, you know, we've been bequeathed something of great value by another culture. And uh, if we're going to, as we inevitably must, given that we're in a different context, reinterpret things um, to do so, you know, with 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 due respect for, for, for the fact that, um, you know, we've we've taken something and done something else with it. Just simply by acknowledging that would would be you know, a, a big step towards defusing some of those arguments. But at the same time, as I was trying to emphasize, I think the reason the arguments exist are because people are looking to pick fights and they're looking to advance other agendas under the guise of this, you know, wonderful purification project. And I think, as you rightly say, the term cult cultural appropriation is, I mean, it's, it is completely meaningless to me, to be honest. It's just it's just become another stick people hit each other over the head with. I don't, I don't think it necessarily has a easily defined meaning. Um, but if we're going to try and avoid being crass, disrespectful, um, exploitative. I mean, those are clearly you know, in line with the principles of what, what people wish to talk about these days as Sanatana Dharma. That's represented in the Mahabharata as respect for all beings, love for all beings. If we're motivated by that, that's going to defuse the tendency to, to rip, rip each other off and, and be mean to each other. So if we're, if, we're not, if we're not motivated by that at our heart's level, then hopefully not too much of this stuff that bothers people will manifest. But people will still be flogging workshops with all sorts of slogans. <laughs> and so, you know, what we're going to do if somebody wants to go out after, you know, capitalist yoga in the West, they'll always find a reason to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I want to end with a slightly obnoxious question for you, Daniel. <laughs> um, you know, so, of course, your book is called The Truth of Yoga, which I know was partly um, uh, at the bequest of your publisher. Um but, you know, part of what seems to be emerging from our conversation is this, the takeaway that there is no true yoga. 
Um, mm. But many people, you know, m might take this as an observation that disempowers their connection to their practice, kind of like how we were discussing before. Um, you know, many want to see that what they are doing as connected to some kind of yogic truth, however, you know, broadly defined. And so, you know, the very suggestion that there is a history of yoga implies a kind of connectivity that transcends the history and that justifies bringing it together, bringing the various kind of historical tendrils together in the way that you've done in the book. So what is the truth of yoga? <laughs> well, I had to go earlier. I mean, I suppose uh, it, yeah, there are many truths. There are many traditions. It's very difficult to sum them all up. But, they're, but they're, they're all trying to you know, transcend this problem of me. Um, we, we, we suffer because of our fixation on ourselves. And uh, yoga, in, in its various forms, addresses that problem head on to the point that the problem is made to disappear, ultimately. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's the truth of yoga. But you know, how many of us are, are really able to transcend a sense of personal identity 24-7 living a Western lifestyle? I mean, very hard to get a job if there's nothing to do, no one to be and nowhere to go. And very hard to, to feed yourself <laughs> without one. Um, so obviously, inevitably, compromises are made and there's ultimate truth and there's relative truth. Uh, and, you know, I've tried to summarize what the tradition says about its ultimate truths while also at the same time with you know, a little, little few words here and there, given a bit of a running commentary about the continued existence of relative truth. And ultimately, you know, I've concluded on that, on, on, on that level. Uh, you know, I've said that. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to paint myself as the enlightened uh, provider of the tablets down from you know, the mountain with the truth of yoga you know, chiseled into them. Um, I've done my best to sum up what I've learned in, in the process of engaging with yoga for now, you know, getting on for ooh, it's 22 years since I first went to India um, and, and started reading about these things. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've done my best to sum things up, but I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling, <laughs> still struggling with the problem of me now and again, <laughs> comes up to whack me in the face. So um, I think the truth of yoga is, is to just remind ourselves that there's that constant process of inquiry that's, that's worth engaging in. And uh, I think that's what's sometimes missing from the postural yoga space. Uh, it, it's not just about the body. It's not just about the feel good. It's, it's about it's about looking a bit more deeply into the, the nature of things, particularly that behind the eyeballs. Mm. Mm. Excellent. All right. Well, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you, Daniel. And I just want to, you know, recommend or encourage everyone who's listening to um, pick up. Can you pre-order it yet, Daniel, or is it? You can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's on, you know, the usual, uh, the, 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 the behemoth of Amazon is, 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 is got, got it up for pre-order. I think you can get it on IndieBound as well, if, you, if, you're, if you're more that way inclined. Um, if you go to my website, truthofyoga.com, there's a link there to, to, to where you can order it from whichever site uh, is, is more to your liking. Um, but there's also an Amazon link if you don't mind that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Truthofyoga.com. And then also um, check out Daniel's website, which is danielsimpson.info. Um, I also didn't mention that Daniel is also on faculty with us at Embodied Philosophy. He teaches portions of our yoga philosophy online training, which just recently started um, in September. And so if you'd like to learn a bit more um, uh, from him, you can join us for one of... Uh, uh, those trainings, or you can also um, get in touch with Daniel at the um, uh, the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Daniel, do, is there anything else that you want to share about what's coming up for you? Any workshops? Anything you'd like to uh, let the audience know about? Oh, I guess it depends when this is going out. There's a, um, there's a, there's a workshop I'm doing online um, in Newcastle in the northeast of England, but thanks to the pandemic, it's globally streamed. It might be a bit early if you're on the west coast of America, but on, on yoga in the Bhagavad Gita from a very practical point of view of just actually, you know, what does it mean to, to live in the world with a yogic perspective? And that's coming up, I think, the 14th of November. But really, yeah, keeping an eye out for, for the book coming out, I'll have a lot more you know, uh, things that I'm putting out into the world around around January. So uh, yeah, if you have a look at my website, there'll be lots on there in the next few weeks, next few months. Excellent. Well, definitely pick up uh, The Truth of Yoga, A Comprehensive Guide to the History of Practice. And again, that will be published in January. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Jacob. No, pleasure to chat to you too. Thanks for such great questions. <laughs>